This is TK Coleman, and today we're gonna help you get your money right. Think about that, la, 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 wait till I get my money right. Well, wait no longer, because today my guest, Sirenice Pierce, is the creator of The Poised Lifestyle, and she holds the, uh, the distinct honor of having eliminated $99,000 of debt in five years. $99,000 of debt. So, man, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of debt to get out of. I mean, just that alone is a massive value proposition uh, that tells you that we're about to talk, talk to somebody that's worth listening to. Um, she is really adamant about helping people resolve the often felt tension between the pursuit of their dreams and the pursuit of financial sta stability. Uh, so many times we have these things that we wanna do in life and what seems to get in the way, the money. We don't have enough or we got too many debts. We got bill collectors raining down on us. Sarenice is gonna give you her insights on how to deal with those things. She's been featured in Forbes Women. She is a millennial money expert. And uh, I'm just excited to talk with her about her story, her struggles, what are the, the factors and forces that shaped her mission and what you can do to get started on the process of becoming more financially literate and economically self-sufficient. Sirenice, thanks for joining me today. So much for having me here, TK. Yeah, I'm excited. I've been I've been watching all your videos on Instagram, checking out all your posts. So it's good to be able to talk with you live. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I want to start off by reading something that you said on your website. You said I created this blog to help millennial women like myself balance their finances and lifestyle with poise. I want to know what were the challenges and observations that drove you to the point of saying this is what my life is about. It's funny because that's when I envisioned my life. I always envisioned myself, you know, going to a corporate office, dressing up in really nice suits and, you know, yeah. helping people, making money. Kind of like, you know, the fantasy that we have when we're like, like, you know, ambitious still. And I didn't, I've never really considered myself to be, you know, a financial expert or be talking to young women and motivating women to finally taking charge of their financial confidence. And through the journey, you know, I've learned a lot about myself, learned a lot about how the pressures that millennials deal with, the pressures that women deal with, the pressures that Latina women of color have to deal with. And, you know, I think we could all we can all remember hearing the news how they blame millennials for the student loan crisis. They went through the 08 recession. They're, you know, not making enough money. They're getting into a lot of debt. And it just feels like it's an attack, like a attack, you know, when you're trying to just get educated and trying to achieve your version of the American dream. And it just feels unattainable, especially when you start putting everything, all the responsibilities that women have to deal with on top of that. You know, we're trying to get educated. We're trying to raise our kids. We're trying to make sure we're healthy meals for our kids and, you know, working out, still appearing to be you know, successful and feminine at the same time. It's a lot of internal battles and it's overwhelming at times. So I created because I could relate to that. I dealt with that, especially when I first became a mom. You know, you always felt like a failure every single day, especially in the society. Your house isn't clean enough. You don't have enough money saved. Your kids don't look, you know, like an Instagram filter picture. And for a lot of people, you know, that kind of deters them to even start um, managing their finances and finding their voice and stepping up to the plate as women. I, I saw the quote that you posted recently that you talked about that if the room looks the same with you or without you, that's how you become irrelevant. And for women, we've been irrelevant when it comes to personal finances for a very long time, a little mm. <laughs> too long. And even when I worked at Merrill Lynch and at Ameriprise, you would see women that have you know, a lot of money, husbands who you know make money as well and they had no idea what they were being invested in no idea what was going on with their finances if they had how much life insurance they had and fortunately their husbands ended up passing away you know they were lost they didn't know how to pay bills they didn't know how to um, manage their you know their finances how to you know create their estate after their partner that they had mm -hmm. responsible for all of the finances are no longer there 
And I saw this a lot even during the 08 recession with my mom and a lot of my mom's friends. You know, they end up getting divorces or losing their husbands and they were a hot mess. And it was so unfortunate to see, you know, these women that, you know, they raised us. They're the ones that put in the hard hours, you know, helping us with our homework and taking us to school. And they've always been, you know, overshadowed because they didn't have that that confidence that mm. financial confidence to really speak up and say, I don't agree with this. I think we should look for another solution or another route. And they never felt like they're, they brought anything to the table. And that's something that I didn't want to experience. Me. I don't want my daughter to experience that. And I don't want anyone that I know or care about to experience that or to feel that way. I want women to know that you're an asset. You need to know that you're an asset worth investing, being invested in. And that you do set the tone for life and your finances and you don't have to stay silent anymore. You know, that's how we start that confidence and feeling more comfortable speaking up in these rooms and making sure that, that we're irrelevant. Because as women, you know, there's more women in this world than ever. <laughs> and we need to make sure that all of the next generation of women feel confident financially and that they know that they bring something to the table. And the really big, a big difference when it comes to how women manage their finances and their investments and else in life. And I want them to know that they have a place, they have a community, they have someone that can relate to them, understands their struggles, and just feel like they're not alone. Hmm. One thing you, you mentioned uh, millennials and, and how we blame everything on millennials. I think that's funny because it's like somebody had to raise these millennials, right? I mean, they, they didn't just they didn't just pop into existence uh, with whatever issues or challenges we want to pin on them. Somebody, somebody had to raise these millennials. Somebody had to teach these millennials. So you, you can't blame somebody that you raised or that you taught uh, without without saying something about yourself. Right. And we we can't pass on to other people what we ourselves have not internalized or acquired. And so many of the things that we see being done wrong by young people today, the the financial Ill, uh, illiteracy or whatever it may be, a lot of it's just bad habits that that we were able to perhaps get away with a little bit better. But because the world has changed in so many ways, bad habits are getting exposed and exploited a lot more quickly. And so I, I, I just think that's an important piece, you know, whenever people talk about the millennial side. I, I, I want to ask you about, you, you, you mentioned about um, being an, an asset and recognizing how how important it is to be financially literate. I, I think one of the things that affects us is, is how we're raised to think about money. And mm -hmm. money is kind of treated like this thing that is just supposed to take care of itself if you're a good person. You know, if you're respectful to others, if you're kind and you work hard, then money will just kind of like sort itself out around all of those character traits. But then when you get into the adult world, you realize, OK, the ability to negotiate a salary, that's a skill that if you don't ask for what you're worth or a charge, other people aren't going to lead the conversation about money. You got to be the one to ask that if you don't learn specific economically valuable skills, you won't make money. And even though people will think you're nice and kind, you just won't get paid. So I guess my, my question to you is. I, I want to hear you talk about the money mindset that we're raised with. And I, I want to hear you make the case for why caring about money and trying to become money smart isn't isn't just this a matter of like greed and materialism, that, that there is that there is something virtuous about caring about these things and thinking about money. I think that's a really good point. Oh, it kind of goes back to how we were raised when we watched movies about the rich and wealthy and the powerful guy in the office. And we're like, oh, he was sweet, selfish. You know, all he cared about was money. And he kind of like the <laughs> when it came to Christmas and, you know, finding happiness and stuff of that nature. And I think we need to start realizing that with the tone to change that narrative, especially, you know, a lot of women were raised the kids were being vigilant of what they're consuming when it comes to movies and social media and you know on youtube you have to be very cautious of what they're consuming because you can't change the narrative if we keep accepting 
that the movies and you know, the media keep on portraying rich and wealthy, selfish people. If you know deep down that you are a good person and that you have purpose in helping other people, make sure you're doing that now. Don't be scared to build wealth because you think you're going to change. I, I love mm. this quote where it's that um, money just emphasizes who you already are. And a lot of people who are genuinely good people, who are giving people, who are, you know, cautious of, you know, the next generation, it's really important that, that we teach our kids that, you know, when you have money, it's a tool to help you um, amplify who you already are. If you're a giving person and you have money, you're going to give more. You're going to get more involved when you're giving on top of that, because now you have more time to do so. You know, if you're someone who wants to make a change in your community because you're seeing, you know, wrongs not turned right, you're going to be the person who has the time and the resources and tools to make that change more of a reality. And you might not, you know, change the whole world, but you can at least change your reality. And this is the little bubble that you are in, that you're raising your kids and you know, you're teaching them the values and the things that are most important. And if we keep on accepting, you know, society to tell us you have to be selfish, you have to be, um, you know, greedy or frugal or cheap, whatever you want to say to be successful, that's not realistically the case. And I think once we change that narrative, we're going to start seeing more people not feel ashamed or to start building wealth and feel more empowered to, you know, change the next generation and start breaking generational curses. We can't do that if we're scared. <laughs> we don't yeah, want to turn yeah. into someone that, you know, seeing in the mirror. So we need to continue loving who we see in the mirror and amplifying who we see in the mirror with the wealth that we are building. That's a really good point. You know, it's interesting because if, if you have a belief system that says making this much money um, makes you a bad person, then that means subconsciously you're going to go to work to protect yourself from ever becoming something that you think is bad. So whenever you have opportunities to make more money or to learn more about money, you're going to those things are going to be invisible to you because you're constantly protecting yourself from being what you think is a bad person. So you got to deal with those belief systems for sure and embrace this idea that um, understanding these things can can actually empower you to be more generous and, and do more good in the world all right i want to talk about how do we start because it's one thing to believe that you have value it's, it's another thing to to really step into it right so money is one of those subjects like anything that has numbers in it that's intimidating for a lot of people i i even saw you um it's, it's your most recent video on instagram and and, and you were talking about your your, your, your five account method. And I, I, I do want you to get into that. But one of the first things that the lady said is that's nice, but most people, and, and I think that's a common thing, right? Oh yeah, this sounds great as an ideal, but how do you get started? What do you say to the person that feels overwhelmed, intimidated? Like I don't have enough money or knowledge to even begin thinking about this stuff. I think the reason that people get overwhelmed and, you know, what kind of want to push it off is because they don't really know what they want out of life. And I know that sounds kind of crazy because we in society, they tell us exactly what, you know, makes us happy, what we need to have. We need to have the house, the kids, the marriage, the retirement, the nice car, the nice vacations. And they're like, that equals, that equals happiness. But when you are doing actually financial planning, where you're helping people figure out a game plan of how to get from point A to point B of where they want to see themselves in the future, you know, you start asking them pretty questions like, what are your short term goals? What are your long term goals? And a lot of people would be surprised to realize that most people don't. My dad experienced this as well when he was in real estate. You know, people would have the cookie cutter goal of wanting to buy a house. And then he'll be like, okay, what neighborhood do you want to buy? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> How many rooms do you want? Do you want a pool? Do you need, you know, a big kitchen? Do you cook a little? Yeah. I don't even know. You know, and I was like, oh, people are so used to being told what to do, what goals mm -hmm. to set, how to um, perceive yourself as being successful, that we don't even sit back and think about what we actually want. And realizing that that starts by looking at what you have. A lot of people, you know, they have a goal of buying the house because they want to live in a better school district. And they're like, 
they close themselves off because like I have to buy a house. It's so expensive. These neighborhoods, you know, they're pricey. Even here, like in California, they're pricey. But what they don't realize is that it just takes a few micro tweaks to your mindset and how you're trying to achieve that goal to really get you to that goal of, you know, living in that neighborhood that you want to live in for the school districts and the environment, you know, in the community. And they don't realize that they could buy a condo. They can rent an apartment that still gets you to the goal that you realistically want. You want to move to that neighborhood for a reason, for a purpose to get your kids in a better school district, to have that, you know, that community that you feel that will amplify the goals and values you want for your children. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to buy a half a million dollar house or a million dollar house to achieve that. And people are like, oh, I didn't really think of it that way. And that's because we're only looking at it as, you know, those cookie cutter goals. Once we actually start breaking apart what we want and what we value from those goals, that's when we're realistic what we actually want accomplish for ourselves to make ourselves you know feel happy or accomplished um the same thing when looking at your actual where you're actually at you know a lot of people they want to start living in the future and i i'll admit it i'm a futuristic person i love dreaming and you know talking about my goals and my passions like that's me all day but it's really important to make sure that you know where you're currently at and a lot of people what they want to do when it comes to financial planning. They want to start with the investments and talk about retirement and traveling the world, but they don't want to talk about their budget, how much they're currently spending, what their actual life looks like right now. And that's where you realistically start. You have to start there because you have to see what's working, what's not working when it comes to your expenses, your actual lifestyle. You know, if it's just the home that you live that you're not happy with, can we make modifications to make that a reality for you so you can start you know, feeling fulfilled and start living your dreams now, not having to wait 20, 30 years to achieve that. Because there's a lot of people who are on this fire movement where they're just trying to retire and they don't even know, you know, what that really looks like for them. They don't realize that has a lot of hidden costs behind it. It's not just buying the house, it's can you maintain the house? Can you pay it off? Will you continue to make that a home, not just a house? And for a lot of people, you know, again, We've been told what goals we need to set and we're not our own. And that's why it's so easy to feel overwhelmed because you don't feel passionate or purposeful with that. And I learned that through a lot of experiences I had to go through. Um, When my son was diagnosed with a heart defect, I was pregnant with my second child. And, you know, a lot of people, they, they told me, you know, it's not that bad or, Some people be like, I don't know how you went through it. It sounds like a lot. But when we found out that he had a heart defect, everything else paused. All the goals that, you know, we were told to have didn't matter anymore. The only goal that I had in mind was getting money to pay for my son's surgery so that when he does have his open heart surgery, I could be mentally, you know, intertwined with the situation and not thinking about the money. And, you know, that's that was a big accomplishment for me because it was a very such a difficult moment because you that's something you can't control you know that's something that you have to just pray on and put in the hands of god at that point and it's difficult because you know so many people when i was um in the children's hospital waiting to hear you know the results which came out positive thank god everything was very good but we realized that there were a lot of people there that were struggling with the finances. Um, there are some people who had to leave during the surgery to go do Uber to try to make some money to pay for the surgery. There were people who were sleeping in their cars mm-hmm. because only one parent can sleep, um, be with the child at the hospital. Some people weren't able to get the Ronald McDonald house. Some other people were relying on the donated food from the Ronald McDonald house. And it's hard to see. It's very hard to see, you know, seeing people struggle financially and emotionally. And and when you're the is, you know, you're allowed to really focus on the things that are truly important to you and that actually matter to you, the things that you actually value. And that purpose, that clear purpose, really pushes you forward. And it allows you to start setting goals that matter to you, that make you want to put action towards it. And you can't do that when 
you know, you're just trying to accomplish a cookie cutter goal that you don't really, you don't really feel. And I feel like that's the part that people miss when it comes to personal finances. It's personal. You have to feel it. It has to be something that, you know, you feel in your heart that this is where you need to be doing, what you need to be focused on. And you will accomplish a lot more when you're actually purposeful with the goals that you have. And they're not just goals that were given to you. I, I think that's, I mean, you made several good points. I really like that last point in particular, because I think this idea of, of doing things that you feel passionate about often gets brushed aside as a form of magical thinking where uh, people assume what's being taught is, hey, if you do something that makes you feel warm inside, uh, you will magically become a millionaire just because you're happy doing what you do. No, the, the principles of success remain the same. You still have to work hard. You still have to make sacrifices. You still have to create value for other people. You still have to be indispensable and come up with creative ideas that make you do what you do in a way that's special. But what's your best chance of doing that? Doing something that other people think you ought to do that bores you? Doing something that makes you feel dead inside? Or doing something that really makes you feel alive so that when the people in your family are like, all right, you got to stop working. We need to go do this thing. You're begging for just 10 more minutes to, to finish that project. If you find those types of things, that's how you're going to work hard. That's how you're going to be really special. That's how you're going to bring a lot of personality to your work. So I love that piece that you added on the, um, on the purposeful stuff. And I think it's I wonder, really funny oh, because oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to share because what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, when, you go through the difficult times in life. Everyone wants to go through the good times in life, you know, but those difficult <laughs> yeah, times yeah. in life, they teach you so much. And me going through that, you know, that situation with my son and finding purpose behind everything that I did was one of the main reasons of how I actually came up with the high five banking method, which you talked about that you saw on my, on my Instagram. And it's really interesting. People don't realize that genius can come from the most difficult moments in life. And it's because you're so passionate about making sure that you're helping as many other people as possible to help them avoid some of the pain and some of the stress that you went through. And that's one of the things that, you know, I really want to share with my content, with my community and with everyone in your community as well, because, you know, we don't want to see other people struggle unnecessarily. We want to make sure people are learning the lessons they have to learn, but not, you know, in a way that they, they feel hopeless. And I feel like that's what finance makes a lot of people feel when they look at the actual numbers, they feel hopeless. And that's not fun. That's not motivating. That's not moving anyone forward. It's not helping anyone. It's almost like, just get it done. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> that's not really helpful. So I think it's so important that, you know, when you do learn something, make your mess, make sure you're making your mess your message. That's something that Robin Robertson says. And I love that quote because that's exactly what I did when I created the Hi-Fi Banking Method, when I created Poise, um, all of the content and tips that I share with the millennial women in my community, because we need that. We need some glimpse of hope and some realistic, little, realistic tactics that are actually going to help us move forward and get past those mindset shifts that are holding us back so much. Saranice, when, when people think about where they're at financially and they're dealing with money stress, usually there's a feeling of my, my, my most important issue is I need more money. And <laughs> you acknowledge that it's important, but when, when I listen to you talk, one of the things that stands out is you don't think that's the starting point for solving the problem. Mm -hmm. I, I want to hear what is the starting point and why? I think the starting point is recognizing what you do have. Like I said earlier, it's starting where you're actually at. And for so many people, we've built up small little habits that are actually holding us back. And we don't even realize it. I think that's the crazy part when like, it's hidden. It's like a hidden um, financial trigger that actually forces us to do the things that aren't gonna benefit us. And a lot of times when I talk about, you know, the high five banking method and different strategy, realistically see where you're at financially, I tell people you have to focus on your mandatory needs, which is your bills. For a lot of people, everyone's like, oh, your bills, that's what's holding us back. You know, if I didn't have all these bills, I could be traveling, I could be investing, I could be enjoying my best life. And, you know, coming, since my family came from Dominican Republic and when I visited um, 
kind of a culture shock because in America, you know, we kind of assume that, you know, housing, you have groceries, you have uh, food on the table, you have lights. And then you go visit your grandparents and you're like, they barely have a home that's like, you know, safe. They have no food in their fridge. The electricity comes and goes as it pleases. And you start realizing that these things are not given. They are a blessing to have. They're not, you know, the things that are holding us back. They're the things that are propelling us to allow us to think clearly and really focus on the things that we want to do and that we need to do to survive and push forward. And I think that mindset shift that people have when it comes to budgeting and prioritizing their mandatory needs and not feeling like it's actually holding them back and it's like stringent. That's what budgeting kind of supposedly has that stigma that it's holding you back and not allowing you to, you know, spend as you would like to. People start to realize that they're truly not living paycheck to paycheck when they actually do the calculation of how much their actual bills are. And that's why I love sharing the Hi-Fi Banking Method because it separates your bills and your lifestyle so you can clearly see how much your bills cost. And for you to start seeing some hope within your finances and say, okay, it's not my bills that are holding me back, it's my lifestyle that's holding me back. And a lot of the lifestyle things are really difficult for people to let go of because those are all choices that we've made throughout our life. And the reason, you know, when I looked at my lifestyle, my husband's lifestyle, when we're combining our finances, you have to dig deep on why is your lifestyle the way that it is. Like I used to spend a lot of money on personal care, on getting my eyebrows done and my nails done. And my husband's like, why do you spend so much money on these things? And it wasn't until we communicated clearly that, you know, I was raised with four other women in the household. And these were things that, you know, were very expensive to do. And sometimes it wasn't in the budget. We had to do them ourselves. I never got the luxury of, you know, going to the nail shop or going to get my eyebrows done professionally or getting my hair done professionally. Um, so those were things that I wanted to enjoy now that I had money. And that's why I was increasing my lifestyle. My husband, on the other hand, he's from Alabama. So his family, you know, they were always tight on money and they never really went out to eat. They they think the fanciest restaurant they went to in that city was like, um, what was it? Uh, Red Lobster. He's just like, oh my God, that's like, you made it. If you can go to Red Lobster. I'm just like, Red Lobster, (laughs) you know? And I'm just like, really? And he's just like, yeah, that's like the top of the top right there. And when he started when he started making money, he was spending a lot of his lifestyle money on going out to eat, enjoying those experiences, tasting different foods from different mm-hmm. cultures. Yeah. And you know, that's something he didn't get to experience and that's why his lifestyle was so high. And you know, once you experience it, you have to tell you remind yourself you've experienced it, you don't have to overdo it. And I think that's the hard part for a lot of people. We got in, into the routine of experiencing, experiencing, experiencing different things, you know, traveling here, eating there, buying clothes here, that we forget that we don't have to overdo it to still have a very fulfilled life. We can do it, but we don't have to overdo it. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges and game changers for people is when they actually separate their bills and lifestyle and clearly see that their lifestyle is what's holding them back, not their bills. That's powerful. Speaking of lifestyle, let's talk about $99,000 worth of debt, because I want to know how you got into it as well as how you got out of it. So (laughs) whatever you're willing to share along those lines, I want to hear about this. So realistically, most of our student, uh, most of our debt was actually student loans. Half of it was student loans. The other half were cars. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that once you start adding up those numbers for two people, the debt adds up quick. Two cars right then and there is already like five fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, cars are expensive. They're not free. <laughs> um, the same thing with student loans. You know, my husband went to school in Alabama. It's a little bit more expensive than here in California. So, you know, when you start adding those two things together, that's another fifty thousand dollars. So, boom, right there, almost a hundred thousand dollars of debt. And it wasn't that we were like going to credit card debt. We were trying to live above our means. We were realistically investing in ourselves so that we can open up doors, so that we can be sitting in those rooms, like in the fight in Merrill Lynch and, you know, these executive tables where you don't see a lot of young people of color at. 
And we, those doors would have never opened if we didn't invest in ourselves and take the risk of going to school and doing something that we were passionate about and that we wanted to do. Um, with the cars, you know, we both had lemons for a while and lemons only go so far. <laughs> You know, you get to a point where your car is no longer working and you have to make that investment to get to work and, you know, also prioritize your safety. You know, I got my car once I got pregnant and I was like, you know, I need a car that's safe. I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm taking care of my child and we're, we feel confident that, you know, if we do get in an accident, the car can, you know, sustain us. I had like a, 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 a soft top, a soft top convertible at the time that no longer worked. <laughs> So, you know, I always thought about what happens if, you know, we get in a car accident, the car flips, like that's not very safe. So we had to make those choices, but we positioned ourselves to make those choices because before we even got married, we decided to join our finances, to pay off our student loans, to budget and to cash flow our wedding. The steps that we took so that we could, you know, get cars and eventually have a roadmap of how to pay off the debt. And that's the interesting part, you know, a lot of people don't know why they got into debt and that's why they always end up back in debt. But we were very clear on why we got into debt because we talked about it, we opened up about it. And once we discussed it, we realized we can create a game plan. But one thing I do want people to realize, just because you create a game plan doesn't mean that life is gonna go perfect. So uh, there's another quote that I love is, um, what is it? <laughs> I'm like, wait, what is it? <laughs> it's, um, stick to your goals, but stay flexible with your methods. And that's that I had to learn during our debt-free journey. I realized that it wasn't a coincidence that we were able to do all of our student loans before we got married. It wasn't a coincidence that, you know, we were able to start two businesses during, you know, while we were raising our family and paying off debt. It wasn't a coincidence that, you know, we live the lifestyle that we live. And a lot of it had to do with the way that we managed our money. It wasn't budgeting and just setting goals. And I think that's something that, you know, in finance, a lot of people tell you, oh, just set a budget, just set goals and just keep going. Just don't look back, just don't look up, you know, just keep going, going forward. And there's a lot more to it. You know, there's a lot of emotions tied into debt. There's a lot of emotions tied into spending and setting goals and making sure that you have enough money saved in case an emergency happens. Because like I said, it was in the middle of my debt-free journey that, you know, my son had his situation with his heart defect. We had people in our family uh, pass away. It didn't go perfect, you know? And it was important for us to stay flexible and be like, you know what, we're gonna focus on the emergency fund right now. You know what, now that this has passed, now we can start focusing on paying off the rest of the you know, a lot of different things, but realize that, you know, this is adulting. This is part of adulting. We have to create a system that actually helps us. And that's where the high five banking method comes so into play because it allowed us to um, create a system that helped us stay on our budget, that helped us achieve our financial goals, and also helped us curve some of those spending triggers and financial fears that we were always trying to hide with debt or with our credentials or something of that nature. And it's really important to make sure that you're hitting those things on the head and you're taking um, the time to peel those onions of down to the onion to realistically figure out why are you still doing these habits that are clearly not benefiting you. They're not helping you. They're actually hindering you and making you more stressed and more concerned when it comes to how your marriage is doing, how your future finances are doing, how you're gonna raise your kids, your lifestyle. It all intertwines so deeply. So it's so important to get to the root of your financial fears. And I think that once we talked about our financial fears and how my husband's family was affected by the OIT recession, you know, how my dad was affected by the OIT recession, we started realizing there's a lot of um, symmetry in this. And a lot of it had to deal with not having the financial foundation and confidence necessary mm -hmm. to build a positive um, environment for us to thrive. Because if you have that fear just attacking you in the back of the head saying, what if your business doesn't succeed? What if you fail? What if you lose everything? You know, if you don't have some type of system to calm those voices down, you're going to out. 
and you're going to get distracted and you're going to feel fearful. So as women, as millennials, as people of color, we need to remind ourselves that we need to have a system in place to reduce those those little fearful noises in the back and really focus on what we're trying to achieve. And that's what we did with the high five banking method because we found a lot of purpose behind everything that we did. We weren't just spending to spend. We weren't just saving to save. We weren't just, you know, out here saving money like quarters. We had a very clear purpose. And that purpose is what actually pushed us, motivated us to stay consistent and to stay consistent on what we talked about, you know, what, 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 were, what was going to be our budget? What was going to be our goals, our short-term goals, our long-term goals? What was our life going to look like? And it, it reminds that we did set the tone for our life. No matter who's president, no matter what the economy is going through, we want to make sure that we set the tone for our life and our finances. And that's why we created the Hi-Fi Banking Method. And that's why I share it with everyone. And just in case you guys are wondering, okay, what is this high five banking method? It's a simply a banking structure that helps you organize your accounts with purpose. Um, it holds you accountable when you don't feel like in control when it comes to your finances. And it also helps you stick to your goals and manage your budget at the same time. It's composed of five bank accounts, two checking accounts and three savings accounts. One checking account specifically for your bills one checking account specifically for your lifestyle so you can still you know have a little bit of fun just you know put a cap over it <laughs> and then when it comes to this three savings accounts it's one for your emergency fund one for your long-term goals and one for your short-term goals about that fi the, uh, the 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 five accounts tell me those last three one more time so the last three are going to be the savings accounts there's going to be one savings account for your emergency fund one's account for your long-term goals and one for your short-term goals. So tell me what's the difference between like my short-term goals and my, my emergency fund and, you know, like my lifestyle, what, what is short-term even for? What's like so an example? So let me start from the beginning. <laughs> so <laughs> for the bills checking account, which is actually the most important checking account, like I said earlier, you want to prioritize your needs first. That's going to include housing, transportation, groceries, making sure you have, you know, the right nutrition to um, energize you and get you through the day. And a lot of people, you know, they need to remind themselves, this is the most important account that you have, and this needs to be your first priority. After that, it's gonna be your lifestyle checking account. This is gonna be for like going out to eat, entertainment, your hobbies, the things that you love to do. Um, just you wanna make sure that you're not overspending in this account and not going into debt. That's what a lot of people do. They end up um, realizing when they do their budget, they don't have enough money for a lifestyle and still save. So what they end up doing is going into credit card debt, increasing their bills, doing a little bit of lifestyle, creep and it kind of sets a tone for a negative habit to happen when it comes to your personal finances. It's unfortunate, but it's true. <laughs> then when it comes to the three savings accounts, the first savings account is going to be for your emergency fund. I am a big believer in having money set aside for emergencies. Again, life does not go perfect ever something you know you can plan the perfect vacation but there could still be a storm in the tropics that happens all the time it always rains over there so it's really important to have enough money set aside for your bills and for any expenses if you get hospitalized like what we're going through with covid right now a lot of people have lost their jobs they're in the hospital right now they need someone to you know make sure that they have enough money to get by that's why it's so important to have that emergency fund. And then when it comes to the long-term goals account, this is an account that not everyone can um, participate in right away. Some people might not be positioned or have goals that they want to achieve the next five years. You know, this is for things that, you know, are have big ticket items. Like if you wanna buy a house, you wanna buy a new car, you wanna go on a trip to Europe, you, um, you wanna have a wedding, a baby. Those things have a big ticket item on it, you know, and it's OK that, you know, you have goals that you want to achieve. You just want to make sure that you're purposeful and you know exactly what you want to save for. That's why it's so important to be very purposeful when it comes to how you're saving and making sure you have a designated place for those long term goals. Now, for the short term goals, this could be fun things that you want to do, like Christmas and anniversaries, birthdays, um, mm -hmm. Disneyland, little trips that you want to do with your family, things that you want to do in the next 12 months. But it could also be some boring stuff that people forget. 
like annual memberships to Costco or, you know, book buying or a car registration. It's the one that always gets me because my car registration is in January, like right after Christmas. I'm just like, why is my car registration like in the worst <laughs> month possible? And we tend to forget about those things. Again, we're human. We have to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and not allowing ourselves to get bombarded by these small expenses that could realistically um, trigger us to going back into debt. And that's something that is very difficult for a lot of people. But once you um, create a system, that's what this high five banking is about. It's about creating a system that reminds you about what your priorities are reminds you that you do have money to save to spend on yourself you're not like on a you're not being deprived from anything you have money set aside for emergencies you're thinking about your long-term and your short-term goals and for a lot of people again the long-term and short-term goals these are overwhelming because they haven't really thought about this this is new to them they're like oh i haven't really thought about what i want what i want what i value what i'm trying to save for and they usually just jump the gun and go into debt or, you know, try to um, speed up the process to getting to those goals to, you know, hopefully pursue some type of enjoyment or goal that they always wanted to achieve from childhood. So it's really important to not let your childhood goals influence what you actually want now and where you're at right now. Because again, sometimes mm -hmm. I know when I was a kid, my dad was in real estate. He let us look at old house magazines, well, new house magazines. And I was always like, oh, I can't wait to get my mansion. I'm on my infinity pool. I need like a four car garage for all my luxury cars. And now that I'm older, you know, I'm reevaluating those goals. I'm like, I'm not trying to clean that mansion. I'm not trying to, you know, pay the yeah. the property taxes on that and the light bill. Those things yeah. start um, becoming more stressful and you don't really enjoy your life or start thinking about the peace that you want to experience in life because now you have more responsibilities. You have things that are pulling you away from spending more time with your kids, doing their homework with them and, you know, traveling to see family members. And that's why I think it's so important to reevaluate your goals and to really think about what you want out of life. And I know that goes a little back to, you know, starting where you're at and realizing that you what value what you value is what's actually going to bring that purpose out of you to want to achieve those goals. It's not going to be um, society telling you you need to buy, you know, a mansion in La Jolla, which is like a really nice neighborhood here in San Diego or buying, yeah. you know, a really nice car. That's not what's going to bring you happiness or actually motivate you to continue pushing toward those goals. It's going to be the things that you value, the things that make are purposeful to you. And that's why I think it's just, again, so important to recognize that and to dig deep. <laughs> I know it's like a little yeah. uncomfortable for people, but you know, if you feel uncomfortable doing this in front of a financial planner or with a financial coach, that's why it's really important to make sure you're doing the therapy and the, the self reflections at home first. And if you need to talk to a therapist or a financial advisor to get more help on how to achieve those, you know, really thinking about what you're trying to achieve out of life, that's why it's important to do that <laughs> early on instead of just waiting and, you know, following the trends of, oh, I need to wait until I'm retired to live my best life, or I need to, you know, make more money so that I can enjoy my life and live my best life. I'm like, that's not the case. And I think that's yeah. a big eye opener for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I, I love, I love your, your emphasis on the language of, of adopting systems, because mm -hmm. although systems might feel like a, a headache at first, they, they feel like a lifestyle that you don't even really think about in the long run. It just fades into the background of something that you do. And I think something that really gets a lot of people with conversations like this is there's this feeling of, oh man, I don't, I don't wanna have to think about all of that. And when you go from a lifestyle where you don't think about things at all to having to meticulously analyze and document where every dime goes, that's so overwhelming and stressful and it feels like you're sucking the joy right out of your life. It, it's analogous to when you when you make dietary changes, when you just eat for taste, oh, I'm just going to eat what seems fun to eat. And then you start having to think about things that you've got to cut it, cut it short on and improve your diet on. You kind of go into this state of short term depression where it's like, I don't want to have to count calories every day. 
I don't want to have to spend the rest of my life looking at ingredients. And the important thing to keep in mind is you don't. You just have to do that right now. And it feels overwhelming and hard right now. But there comes a point where you actually don't even need to analyze it to just kind of know. You have a feel for what that's going to do to your body. You have a feel for how many calories that kind of item has. You have a good sense of whether or not that contains ingredients you can and cannot have. It's just a matter of retraining what's natural to you. But you do get to that point where it feels natural and you're not feeling like you're just like spending every second of your day quantifying your dream. So I, I really like your language on that. Thank you. I love that too. And that's probably part probably one of the main reasons that I put lifestyle um, as a primary focus when it comes to my brand, because if it's something that like a diet um, or something that you feel like you, someone's telling you you have to do, you're probably not yeah. going to do it. You know, you have to make lifestyle, make it a habit of a routine that you have that just comes off flawlessly. And that's why I also use the word poise in my um brand because sometimes when you're trying to do a new diet or get into a new routine, it feels a little overwhelming. And sometimes yeah. you just need to hear it from someone who has gone through that and figure out what little tweaks they made, they're calling them micro tweaks that they made. Yeah. Bring out that that sense of balance and sense of poise that you need to carry yourself to start creating that routine and getting into that lifestyle in a little bit more of a less stressful or hectic way. I know that's helpful for me. So that's why I love sharing that with other people as well, because I know, you know, it comes off overwhelming, but if you make it part of your lifestyle, like you said, it becomes like, you're not even thinking about it. And that's the best part of, about, you know, when you have a system, it's not just the goals or the budget, it's having a system that holds you up you know, on the days that you're feeling tempted to eat an extra Oreo <laughs> or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I, I also like what you have to say about, about purpose and dreams because I, I think having these really big, ambiguous dreams can be a way of hiding from the demands that specificity makes on your life. So with money, for instance, saying something like, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be really, really rich. I want to have a lot of money. It's, it's kind of lazy because what I'm doing is I'm just kind of brushing past all of the, the changes that I need to make. And I'm putting the pressure on having an undefined, you know, vague, large amount of money. And that's going to solve my problems. And if I do that, I don't have to think about my dream specifically. I don't have to say no, just like you, you, you said in your example. How many cars? How big is my house? What is my house for? What, what, you know, how many vacations do I want to take a year? Like, what do my dreams look like specifically? You know, how, how many hours do I want to work? Am I willing to work? And that's really hard work because it forces you to be honest with yourself. And it's just much easier to be like, I want to be a millionaire. And, and, and I, I think what, yeah. one of the things you yeah. point out is that the problem isn't that you don't have enough money. The problem is you got to be willing to do the work to be specific and honest with yourself about what success means for you. And then when you do that work, as hard as it is, the path is laid out before you. And, and the good news is, in most cases, you don't need to be a millionaire to actually live the life wow. that, that you dream of. And you know, something that I realized as well, even for myself, was how sometimes we pray, right? And we're like, oh, God, just please just let a million dollars fall into my lap. <laughs> And we don't realize that we're not being specific on what we're requesting from the universe. And that's something that, you know, my husband and I have both um, experienced in our journey. There's a lot of hidden costs that we don't really pay attention to. We say, yeah, that's given. Like when you get a luxury car, there's luxury maintenance, <laughs> luxury gas, <laughs> expensive gas, um, higher tiered gas, higher tiered um, car washes, maintenance, all of these things you know, and restrictions that you can and cannot do. And we don't realize that that's part of owning it. It's not just getting it, it's can you maintain it? And it's the same thing with marriage. When it comes to um, these Disney fairy tales <laughs> that women have been exposed to, um, you know, we get, we, we fantasize about our wedding and getting married, but we don't focus on what's our marriage actually gonna look like. Do I work well with my partner? 
Are they my best friend? Can I trust them with my life? You know what I mean? Um, what kind of relationship do we have? Um, and those are the things that people skip on because they're just so focused on the goal of getting married. They don't focus on the goal of staying married. That's not something that they're concerned with. They're just more focused on getting the ring and the wedding. And for a lot of women, we have to be like, you know, there's there's other costs to that. There's other things that entail this whole package that you're requesting. And then they get what they wanted. They got married. You know, you get the car that you want, but then they forget all of the maintenance that has to come, you know, on an everyday basis. You know, you have to nurture that friendship. You have to nurture that marriage and respect each other's boundaries and really learn about each other's um, triggers when it comes to finances or anything else as well and yeah. work together and make a lot of compromises. That's what the Disney stories kind of missed, <laughs> the compromises yeah. that you have to make. There's sacrifices and everything and you're not going to um, feel 100% fulfilled when you know, you're know you ignoring the hard work <laughs> that comes behind it. And I feel like that's something we have to continue um, making that feel like it's something that is not hidden. It doesn't have to be a hidden cost. And people, if we keep hiding it as a society, we're just going to keep on seeing more failed marriages, more people wanting to, um, feeling depressed with the purchases or the goals that they had, that they felt like they wanted. But when they act, they're just like, I don't want this no more. <laughs> I don't like paying these expensive yeah. maintenance costs. You know, that's how we help people avoid depression. And in the little ways, you know, there's also different levels of depression and anxiety and financial fears that we all face. But, you know, those micro tweaks are such a big deal. And, you know, that's what I think is really important for us to continue sharing. And if, you know, we have something to share, make sure you share. Yeah. You, you know, a, another uh, aspect of those fairy tales is that they they have the, the negative effect of making us question ourselves in, in ways that are unrealistic. So, for instance, if if your concept of love means you never have an uncomfortable conversation or an argument, then it's probably gonna be pretty easy to convince you that you don't really love the person that you love. Or if your concept of being passionate about something means you're always in the mood to work on that and you always feel inspired, when you have a, a two month period where you don't feel energized to do that thing, it's gonna be really easy for you to talk yourself into, oh, I must not be a real writer or, oh, I'm, I must not be someone who really loves this thing. And I, and I find that is something that holds so many people back. They talk themselves into believing that I don't have a purpose, I don't have a passion, I don't love who or what I say I love because I have these moments where it feels really painful and uncomfortable and uninspiring to do. And it's like, no, like that's how you know you have a mission. That's how you know you have something worth pursuing. If, if you didn't have any of that, you probably should be worried that you're not challenging yourself to do anything that's meaningful. I went through that. I can relate to that a lot. I, for some reason, I don't know why I felt the need to kind of be like a perfectionist in a certain way, certain mm -hmm. time yeah. where I was like, if I'm not naturally good at this, I'm not going to waste my time doing this. But I always knew that I was very passionate about talking about personal finances, doing video, um, you know, engaging and empowering the next generation of women. But I wasn't good at it in the beginning. <laughs> and like, you know, I'm still working on it even now. And, you know, it wasn't until I had been who really invested in me and embraced that I was still, you know, a gem and not just, you know, a gem to sit down <laughs> and look nice on. I'm, you know, someone that's working on, you know, distributing my passion and uh, things that I'm, I really want to do in life that I realized, you know, I have to work for this. Diamonds aren't just, they don't just appear. They appear under pressure, fortunately. And that pressure mm. is not always nice, you know, and it's not always polished at like the end result that everyone wants to see. And it takes a lot of grit and a lot of hard work, early mornings, um, times where people are saying, why aren't you, you know, relaxing? Why aren't you having fun? And they just don't understand that you're trying to get better at something that you're so passionate about, but you might not be perfect or great at yet. And, you know, it takes time and people will try to rush you and be like, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. You could do everything you want. You know, you're amazing. But they don't know that you're still a diamond in the rough that's still working under pressure to get there. 
to get to a place where you feel a little bit more confident and more polished. And it takes time. It's very unfortunate. You're right. People always want to see the end result and never the struggle. And when they see this, they kind of like they just kind of brush it off, like not that big of a deal. I'm like it is a big deal. These people are yeah. we're working on ourselves, and that's what we need to also emphasize and make it more visible. And I think you know, well, what I've been noticing is a lot of the movies and a lot of the media and people that I look up to, they've been sharing more about the struggles, you know, of getting to where they are at at the moment. And that makes it more motivating, someone that you actually want to listen to. You don't want to just hear, I paid $99,000 of debt and it was perfect. It was great. It was an easy breezy, you know, uh, anyone could do it. And it's like, no, it was rough. I had a lot of rough times during that debt free journey and it wasn't my end goal. You know, that was something that was that I wanted to accomplish along my goal. My real goal was to, you know, start poise, you know, my husband to start his own business and that flexibility of our lifestyle that we wanted and just paying off debt was a goal that allowed us to get there a little faster. And for a lot of people, you know, that's the real stuff that they need to hear. They need to hear the the trials, the tribulations, you know, the situation that I had to go through with my son. They just they could relate and say, you know what? I don't have to go so hard on trying to pay off debt or do this or do that. There is going to be times where I have to pivot and realize that it's okay to rest. It's okay to change my mind on how I want to strategize around my goals and things that I want to accomplish. As long as I still get to the end result, you know, of living a less stressful life and being more happy and being more financially confident, I'm achieving my goal. I don't have to be doing it one way, like, you know, one way or that's it. It's not, um, one thing that my family and I always do is if you feel in your mind that it's, this is the way it is. And if it's not this way, you won't accomplish what you need to accomplish. Or if I'm not doing it like the neighbors are doing it or like John's doing it, I'm a failure. That's where you kind of get depressed and feel overwhelmed. But once you opened up your perspective and say, you know, there's multiple ways to achieve this goal. It's not just one way and that, that's it. And I think those are the small tweaks again, like I'm saying, that really motivate people and open up their mindset to saying these things are achievable for me, but they're not going to be achieved the exact same way that they happen for Sirenes or for TK or Bill or whoever else. They're going to be my way. And I think that's really important for people to understand. That's why personal finance is called personal finance. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, situation yeah. is so different and you have to embrace it. Yeah, that, that's such a good that's such a good final point. When you when you see someone else's success story, the question you got to ask yourself is, is what's my way to live out the fundamental truth of that story? And, and we all have our own unique path and, and we can all learn from someone without having the pressure of experiencing it in exact the same way. Sirenis, I thank you so much for uh, sharing your story and sharing your insights. Where can the people find more of you if they want to learn more? Yes, definitely visit my blog, thepoiselifestyle.com. I'm also on Instagram and on YouTube, Poise Finance a Lifestyle. And I'm always doing two minute Q&A Tuesday to answer your top financial questions, throwing out little gems here and there on Twitter, you already know. And definitely talking more about the high five banking method and how that can help people create a financial system for themselves to help them build their financial confidence. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, everybody, you've been tuning in to the revolution. We'll be live stream. I'll see you next week, Tuesday, TK and Thunder. And on Wednesday, Kamau and I will be back to continue our year in review. I'll see you then.